Hello everyone. I'll talk about non-malleable codes for bounded polynomial depth tempering. This is based on joint work with Dana Dachman Soled and Rafael Paz. So the problem that we'll be talking about is really simple. It's just two parties, a sender and the receiver. The sender wants to transmit a message to the receiver. What makes the problem challenging is that we consider a man in the middle attacker or a tempering function, you can think of it, that sits on the channel, intercepts all the messages that come from the sender, inspects them in any way it wants, and then uh, spits out a possibly different message to the receiver. What we want to guarantee is that the adversary, this adversary that sits on the channel, uh, cannot meaningfully modify the message. And what we mean by meaningful modification is that we want to make sure that the decoded message that the receiver sees in the end of this game is with very high probability, either the original message that was intended to, say, to be sent by the sender or something completely unrelated. And notice that uh, the adversary could always just intercept the message that the sender sent, uh, throw it away, and just send something completely random to the receiver. In this case, we want the message received by the receiver to be completely unrelated because it's independent of the message underlying the real uh, code word. Or we want to make sure that the adversary, no matter what it did, to try to modify the underlying message, it could it didn't succeed. So this, this primitive is called a non-malleable code. It was introduced about uh, 10 years or a little bit more, uh, 10 years ago by uh, Zimbowski, Petrick, and Ricks. Uh, and it has received significant attention uh, from various communities in the past uh, decade or so. It was, uh, for instance, it was used as a building block in uh, modern constructions of uh, multi-source extractors, uh, interesting connections with additive combinatories have been discovered, and it was uh, more naturally uh, used as a, as a building block in uh, various non-malleable cryptographic constructions. So this is a very useful and important notion, uh, but before I tell you what we know about it, I wanted to draw some connections with uh, existing uh, primitives that you may have heard about and explain the differences. So two primitives that uh, I'll be talking about or comparing non-malleable codes to are error correcting codes and non-malleable commitments. So the first distinction between these three primitives comes in the, in the class of adversaries that we're willing to tolerate. In an error correcting code, the adversary sees the code word but is limited in the way it can um, mo modify it or tamper with it. And specifically, usually what we allow the adversary to do is to choose a subset of coordinates, let's say one half of them or one third of them, or some fraction of the code word, of the symbols in the message and modify them arbitrarily. And we want to guarantee that the receiver can recover the original message. non malleable commitments, the adversary sees the message that is sent from a sender to a receiver, but it can apply an arbitrary polynomial time function on it. So it's not limited in the way that it accesses the code word. It can do arbitrary computation and do anything on it, as long as it's polynomial size. And in a non variable code, as you we're gonna see, the adversary is somewhere in between. It's, it's not an arbitrary polynomial size machine, uh, but we hope that it's gonna be a little bit more than just changing a subset of coordinates. And uh, the second uh, difference between these three primitives is that we want to be able to decode them. This is why for instance, this is why in non verbal commitments you can allow arbitrary polynomial sized uh, adversary. It's because we don't really expect the, the receiver to decode, it's just a commitment. In non manable code and in error correcting code, we do expect the receiver to decode. Uh, and this is why we cannot support any polynomial sized attacker. Okay, so this is uh, just to put things a little bit in context. So here's uh, some very basic facts about non manable codes. So first of all, like I, as I alluded to in the previous slide, if decoding can be done efficiently, then there's no way to support all polynomial size tempering functions, right? Because the adversary could decode if it's possible in doing, doing polynomial time. And if the message is equal to some predefined message, let's say it's all zeros, then we just output the all zero string. And otherwise we output the code word. By any meaningful notion of uh, non-malleability, this is a valid tampering uh, 
tempering attack. <clears throat> and that's why we have to limit the adversary in some way if we're willing to, if we're uh, requiring that the coding is polynomial time. So there has been uh, many suggestions as to how to limit the adversary. So uh, for instance, we can limit its running time. It can run uh, slower than the decoding. It might have a small space, namely it might use less space than is required by the decoding, or we can limit in some way the access to the code word. For instance, we can allow an untemperable common reference string, or we limit the, the way the adversary accesses the code word, not in the amount of things he can modify, but in the way it can modify them. And this is where, for instance, one useful notion is, is split state adversaries. So here are some uh, results that are known. So first of all, in the very original work of Dimbowski, Piaček, and Weeks, it was already shown that this primitive exists, at least non-explicitly. Namely, if you choose a random encoding scheme, it will be secure for any uh, circuit of size 2 to the n over 2. And what about uh, explicit construction? So th there has been uh, lots of work, and here are a couple of examples. Uh, if we limit the adversary to be a polynomial size circuit, an arbitrary polynomial size circuit, and then we can support uh, the, we can indeed guarantee non malleability if we assume an untemperable CRS. So we assume there is some CRS that's written in the sky. It has to be bigger than the size of the adversary, so uh, bigger than this S. And the adversary is not allowed to tamper with it, and it's not allowed to, it won't be even allowed to read it because it's so long. But there is a, an explicit construction. Um, there is there's also explicit constructions in um, in models with some something like a sub, like a random oracle model. If we assume the adversary has bounded space, so we cannot just store the whole random oracle in memory. And uh, more recent work uh, focused on constructing non malleable codes uh, against classes, uh, complexity classes, adversaries that come from some well known complexity classes like AC0, NC0. And the most uh, up to date results is, are even construction secure almost again and against NC1. So it's log depth circuits. They, specifically, they obtain log over log log depth circuits. So we have many constructions under many assumptions. Some of them are a trusted setup assumptions. Some of them are, um, are a con assumptions about the explicitness of the construction. And arguably the holy grail or this whole line of work where it leads to is a construction of an explicit non malleable code, right? So we first want an explicit construction of a non malleable code. And we want it to be secure against the best we can hope for, which is a just a bounded polynomial size circuit. So I give you a bound, let's say n to the 100, and I want to construct an explicit non malleable code that is secure or non malleable for all attackers of size up to n to the 100. So this is the, the holy grail, and we want to be able to do this for any polynomial, not just n to the 100. And ideally, we would like the encoding to run in fixed polynomial time. So independent of this 100, so maybe n to the fifth for any fixed polynomial which bounds the running time of the adversary. But as I mentioned, decoding has to take longer. So uh, we want encoding in fixed polynomial time and decoding to depend on the uh, class of the adversary. So this is uh, the holy grail. So what has been done towards this holy grail? Uh, so the first attempt to really achieve something that looks like uh, comes close to the Holy Grail was done by Bol et al. about three years ago. They suggested, well, let's use crypto to see if this task is even possible. And they indeed obtained the result. Uh, they showed that if you assume public encryption and non-interactive zero knowledge, plus some average case hardness for the class of attackers that you're willing to, uh, to capture, then there exists a non malleable code for this class of attackers. So this is a great result uh, in terms of feasibility. The downside is that the 
is that they're using a public encryption scheme and a NIVIC, which both of which rely on uh, CRS. In the case of a public key encryption scheme, it's just a public key of the scheme. And both of them have to be uh, written in the sky in some sense, and they're untemperable uh, by the attacker. The advantage of this construction over previous ones is that here the CRS is short. It's independent of the class F. So this was the first uh, result. And then the follow-up by Bolet al was a construction in the plane model. So right, they got rid of the CRS and they got construction in the plane model. Albeit they had several, uh, still had several caveats. The first is that they relied on P certificates. P certificates is a rather strong assumption. It's a succinct one message argument for a P for all polynomial time computations. And it's succinct in the, the strongest sense that you can imagine. Uh, the proof size is uh, independent of the computation, the witness, um, or the instance. Right? It's just uh, it's the best notion of succinctness you can imagine. And one candidate for this construction is Michalis CS proof system when you instantiate uh, the random worker with the concrete hash function. And this is, to the best of uh, our knowledge, this is the only candidate up to, the, up to now to date. So this is a rather strong assumption. And, but they had, even ignoring this, uh, this strong assumption, which perhaps we're willing to settle for, they had a couple of more uh, downsides. Like one, one was that they obtained non-maliability only for uniform adversaries, as opposed to the standard notion of non-uniform security against non-uniform attackers. They only obtain non-maliability with inverse polynomial distinguishing adv advantage, namely an adversary could perform a, a, a successful tampering attack with some, with some inverse polynomial probability. And uh, lastly, both their decoding and encoding run longer than the adversary. And optimally, we would like to achieve encoding in a fixed polynomial time. So this is what's known about this problem. What we do, we, we have like a meta theorem that implies a new construction of a non malleable code. So here are the three building blocks that we need for our meta theorem. Uh, let me just say that this is not a generic construction in any of these, in any instantiation of these primitives. We use specific constructions and specific properties uh, that I will explain a little bit later. But uh, the general recipe is, uh, is very is easy to explain in a generic way. Uh, so we use three primitives. It's a time of puzzle, a one message non malleable commitment, and the one message uh, zero knowledge scheme. By one message, I mean just a single shot, one message, uh, no CRS or anything like that. To be clear, a time of puzzle is this method to create puzzles that are uh, easy to create, but require uh, some moderate polynomial uh, sequential effort. So even if you have many processors in, uh, even if the adversary has many uh, processors that he can run in parallel, it's a way to generate uh, problems that are still hard to solve as long as the sequential running time is uh, less than some predefined bound. So we use these three primitives uh, with some exponential security and we obtain the following non malleable code. So for any polynomial T, uh, you, there exists a non malleable code where the encoding takes time polynomial in lambda. So lambda is a security parameter, so it's a fixed polynomial. Decoding takes time polynomial in T and lambda. And notice that the, the dependence on T is necessary. And we guarantee non-maliability for all adversaries of size at most T. So this is really uh, achieving the holy grail I mentioned before. And we check all the boxes that uh, you can imagine. We, we achieve non-uniform security. We achieve negligible advantage. So it's negligible non-maliability, like, like what you would expect. We have fast encoding, uh, as I mentioned. And we even get non-maliability for, for a larger class of adversaries. Because we're using time log puzzles, we actually get non-maliability for all polynomial size adversaries, as long as their depth is a priori bounded. So you only need to bound the depth of the attacker, namely the parallel runtime of the attacker. And then you can, we can support arbitrary polynomial size uh, attackers. 
So this is the main theorem. And let me tell you about the specific instantiation that we have. So these are the three primitives, which imply non-malleable code, a non-malleable code for bounded polynomial depth tempering. We instantiate the time of puzzles using repeated squaring assumption, the most well-known construction. And we use two other assumptions, a keyless multi-collision resistant hash and the NIWI to instantiate the other two primitives. So all in all, we get the construction of our non malleable code from three assumptions. It's the repeated squaring assumption, keyless multi-collision resistant hash, and NIWI for NP. So this is the main result of our paper. Let me tell you a little bit about how the construction works. Uh, the construction is very easy to explain in steps. Let's first use the time of puzzle and see what we get. Uh, we encode the message using a time of puzzle and we can decode using the solving procedure of the time of puzzle. This achieves in terms of functionality, it achieves what we want, right? We encode really fast and we can decode within some uh, predefined time, like n to the 100. The problem is that the time of puzzles are not non-malleable. So we cannot just, uh, uh, so we cannot claim non-malleability. They're in fact not non-malleable. So let's add a, compo a non-malleable compo component to the scheme and together with the time of puzzle in the encoding, let's also commit with a non-malleable commitment to the message. So this adds some non-malleable non -malleable component, but the problem is that the coding is independent of it and the adversary could just ignore it, right? It could uh, tamper with time of puzzle and modify the output of the experiment. So we add a zero knowledge proof that shows that, um, that the two components uh, are encoding the same message. So the time of puzzle and the non malleable commitment are consistent with respect to the underlying message. So this construction is really in the spirit of no young double encryption method. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that soon. So this is our final construction. The security definition that we achieve, uh, that this, the, the construction achieves, uh, is the standard one in the non malleable uh, coding literature. Uh, there are two experiments that need to be distinct, indistinguishable. The real world experiment allows an attacker to obtain a code word, modify it in an arbitrary way, and then decode. And the output of the decoding is the output of the experiment. In the real world experiment, there is a simulator that doesn't know uh, the underlying message. It either outputs some message, M field, which is independent of M or it outputs the word same. Same meaning that the adversary didn't change anything. And the output of the experiment is either the original message, if uh, the adversary, if the simulator outputs the same, or it's the unrelated message and field. So this is the natural thing you would expect. And this is what you would choose. Here's the, a couple of words about the main proof idea. So I mentioned that the construction is in the spirit of no, no young double encryption except that instead of using two public encryption schemes like they do, we use a non malleable commitment and a time of puzzle. So let's, one natural approach for the proof would be to say, okay, let's replace the real decryption with a simulated one. And decryption in our case is decoding. So let's replace the decoding procedure with a simulated one. But the challenge is that for us, the, the simulated decoding procedure is to essentially extract from the commitment. So the real decoding procedure is to solve the time of puzzle, but the alternate one would be to break the commitment. And breaking the commitment is a super polynomial time task, while breaking the time of puzzle is a polynomial uh, time task. So it's really, in, it's really non clear a priori how you would be able to move to the simulated decoding procedure without breaking uh, the scheme, the security of the scheme. So here's the problem in detail and where it comes up. So once we, in the proof, once we simulate the zero knowledge proof, uh, we are, and we're trying to move to the, uh, to the alternate decoding where we extract from the, where we extract from the non malleable commitment, uh, two conditions must be satisfied. The first is that the extractor of the non malleable commitment should not be able to break zero knowledge. The second one is that the simulator should not be able to break non malleability. So we get two inequalities. Also, for all known uh, one message zero knowledge uh, schemes, for all of them, the simula simulator running time is larger than the time of, uh, than, larger than the guarantee of zero knowledge, like the, the running time of the, of the distinguisher in the zero knowledge experiment. And it's a major open problem to construct one where the inequality is reversed. 
like the simulator is faster, is really fast. So we cannot use that. So if you take the three inequalities that are written now, you see that the time to extract has to be much smaller than non malleability uh, which is a contradiction, right? Because the extractor of the commitment can extract the underlying value and should and can trivially break non malleability So we get a contradiction, at least uh, in the usual uh, proof strategy. The main idea in the proof is to take advantage of the specific primitives that we're using. And specifically, we're going to introduce in the proof another axis of hardness, specifically non-uniformity. We're going to instantiate the primitives in a very careful way so that uh, the inequalities that we need work out. Uh, what we're going to do is to instantiate the zero knowledge system to be zero knowledge against sub exponential size attackers, while, uh, while showing that simulation can be done in polynomial size, but using a non uniform simulator that has some advice hard coded. Non malleability is going to be for, say, polynomial size attackers, and extraction will be possible in sub exponential size. If you stare at this for two minutes, you'll see that setting the parameters of the schemes of the primitives uh, in this way, you indeed satisfy the three inequalities that we need. Extractor uh, cannot break zero knowledge, the simulator cannot break non malleability, and the extractor can break non malleability. Before concluding, let me mention a couple of more technical challenges that we encounter during the proof. The first challenge is that the time lock puzzles are a polynomial time primitive. An adversary that runs in polynomial time can solve the time lock puzzle. So in particular, the step in the proof or the, the, the step in the reduction where we use the hardness of the time lock puzzle must be implemented in polynomial time. And this seems a priori a little bit challenging, but the point is that the time of puzzles are polynomial time in terms of depth or parallel time, but they don't have to be polynomial time in size. Namely, we instantiate the time of puzzle in a way that uh, it's secure for attackers that have that might have super polynomial size, but some uh, polynomial fixed polynomial depth. And this is how we implement uh, this step in the reduction. The second challenge is that non-uniformity needs to be dealt with carefully. And the reason is that the instantiation of the zero knowledge system that we're using, because we're in the non-uniform setting and the zero knowledge system is a one message system, there's no CRS, there's, no, there's only one message, then the system only satisfies a weak notion of soundness. And this weak notion of soundness roughly, very roughly means that the adversary might know uh, some amount of cheating proofs, or proofs for uh, valid proofs for false statements, but not too many of them. And the proof needs to take this into account, and we need to, uh, to deal with it. I'll refer to the paper for more details. So let me summarize our results. Uh, our first, so the result is a non malleable code for all bounded polynomial depth attackers. Uh, the construction is in the plane model without any trusted setup assumptions. The construction can be viewed because we get hardness for parallel time, uh, for a priori bounded, polynomially bounded uh, parallel time. The construction can be actually viewed as a non malleable time lock puzzle. So we're taking a time lock puzzle and we're uh, making it non malleable. And uh, in the follow up work, we, it was together with the uh, prime fight again uh, task, we performed a thorough study of non malleable time lock puzzles. We have more efficient constructions than what is presented here, which is primarily a theoretical and feasibility results. There we have a really practical and efficient construction with very weak set of assumptions. And we also show that this primitive is really useful for applications. For instance, we get multi-party fair coin tossing protocols and multi-party fair auctions and so on. And I think that this work uh, introduces a couple of very interesting open problems. The first is to improve the assumptions, improve the underlying assumptions, of course. Uh, mostly the, the thing to, to focus on, in my opinion, is the killer hash function that uh, we rely on. And of course, the concrete efficiency of our scheme is not that great if you use existing construction, existing instantiation of all the schemes. And it would be interesting to come up with, a, with an efficient construction, a, pr a practically efficient construction. Uh, without set of assumptions.
So thank you very much for listening and have a good day.